Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic and part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. We move on to the second week, and both of our um, two in the draw will be playing on the final Manic Monday at Wimbledon. Um, a three-set victory for Novak Djokovic over Dennis Kudla, a four-set victory for Roger Federer over Cam Nori. We'll talk about those matches, and we will preview their round of 16 matchups, of course, in the show. Uh, let's start with Federer here, getting through Cam Nori. I guess, you know, this is all about getting better and better every match for Federer. It started off shaky against Manorino. It looked good against his pig- his uh, pigeon, Richard Gazquet. <laughs> and now Cam Nori, a tougher opponent. It got a little bit tougher. But do you think that Roger Federer made that next step up that, that he needed to make, Amy? Yes. Remember last time I kind of compared it to the the magnetic force field and there were holes in the force field well now it's like you know the scene in jurassic park where it's coming back online you know forehand back online da, 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 and the the <laughs> movement back online so little by little the force field is is shoring up um i i saw him early in the match missing you know by three to six inches and i think he was in the process of calibrating, particularly on Nori's really flat backhand, exactly how much spin he needed to put on it, given that it's grass, you know, to make it land in. And he was just missing just a little bit in the early going. Um, but he, you know, he shored it up. And, and yes, uh, he lost that third set. But overall, I think it was a really good performance. You know, we talked about how this was going to be an indicator of where things were at with Federer. And I thought there's a much more impressive effort than the first two matches because you didn't really, you know, the Manorino thing was this fortunate end after something, uh, it was complications. Gasquet was pretty facile and a routine opponent. But here was a guy he hadn't played before who's young and making some moves. I'm not saying, wow, Roger, you're back, baby. You've got it. But at least here we see him. Okay, now he's in the second week of a major. He's where he'd hoped to be, and we're going to see how things continue to shape for him. So this is a good and, and some struggle. I mean, he had chances, 5-all, 15-40 in the third set to serve out the match, but didn't do it, But and then ended up playing well enough in the fourth. I don't think he's going to pull out this time to uh, prepare for Hamburg. No, or the Olympics or anything else. I think <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. no statements, no Sunday no. statements. Okay, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. One part of the match that really impressed me was uh, the crucial four all game in the fourth and what would be the final set. Federer had one break point, got a set, look at a second serve. Nori, of course, serves to the backhand. And on that first break point, Federer just chips it, kind of floats a chip right through the middle of the court, and Nori pounds a forehand on the next ball and wins the point. Then on the next break point, same situa- situation, second serve. Roger, uh, as soon as the toss goes up, skids to his left, scoots around to the backhand corner, finds himself a forehand, even though Nori serves wide, and rips it inside out, which sets up his next forehand, which he crushes inside in and wins the point. That's that confidence adjustment. He takes the risk, he has a go, and it makes all the difference. Was that I on thought- do the, the point you're talking about was a deuce point? No, an add add out for Federer break. Add point. out. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So he he gotcha. basically he runs around into the alley to make himself a forehand, where on the previous break point, he just chipped the backhand return. And gotcha. I just think that is the kind of thing that is like, okay, this is what Roger Federer would do. And he does it. He takes that aggressive risk, that confident risk in a big moment, and it pays off. I agree, but I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call it. It's not, a, it's not a risk as such as much as it's Roger Federer playing the tennis that he knows he needs to be to be Roger Federer. You know, it's like sure. it's, he's taking the shot he knows he needs to take. And the first one was like, oh, wait a second. I'm not supposed to do that. And it's like, you're right. He learned the lesson from it. And he made the adjustment quickly enough to, to know this is what I got to do. And the great thing about grass and the way Federer plays even now and the more slower grass than it once was, you got to run through those green lights. 
when the light turns green, you've got to go through it, and you've got to hit it, and you've got to play these staccato opportunistic points. And so that's different than, let's say, play where hit inside out return. Okay, here comes another ball. Here comes another rally. It's like everything's got to be kind of quick motored on grass. And so Federer, that he realized that that's right. That was very, very encouraging. Yeah. I thought he was really in control of his serve for the most part. I've always suspected that he had different gears on his serve. Like, you know, if he's serving well, he's probably thinking to himself, I don't need to do that, that level up, or I don't need to take that chance, that risk of, of leveling up. And I started to see for the first time since he's been back and all the matches that I've watched, I started to see what I perceive is Roger Federer playing with those gears a little bit. Like, okay, here's a spot where I need a big serve. Let me ratchet it up to fifth gear, a little more risk. And, and he seemed to be very in command of that. I like that. And this gets to the point you made about the calibration. I think what Federer does, it's really fascinating. One of the reasons I think he's so good in interviews is because he takes this interest in the question. You can see Federer, he almost wants to create a new answer every time when he says something, because he wants to be creative, because he wants to because that's a little, some of his nature. And I think in tennis, he does the same thing with his opponents where he, oh, Mr. Nori, we've not met before, have we? And he kind of reads the file and takes the measure. And you only get that through the experience of the match itself. And that's one of the great things about tennis, this relationship sports, like quite how good is that return? What's your ball telling me? How good do I really need to serve against you? I mean, of course, and this is the mm -hmm. challenge of playing someone like Novak where Wow, no one, no one has invented the serve yet that topples Novak Djokovic. But so Federer, when he's playing someone like Nori, he's never, hmm, yes, I'm, I'm aware that you've risen these 40 spots up the rankings this year, but uh, hmm, hmm. And he's seeing, where can I not get hurt? Where can I serve well? How big do I have to serve? And, and, and I think for Federer in particular, that feeling, that comfort is really important. It's different, like Nadal is just like, I need to go to war with you and we're going to just tear each other apart, but Federer needs to find, like you notice when Federer is losing, how he moves quick, more quickly in between points sometimes, he starts to rush, which is yeah. exactly what you're not supposed to do, but it almost makes him all so human. Yeah. Him, yeah. But in this yeah. case, he, he kind of measured Nori and then he could see, and then you're right, that's, that's comfortable, not just for how well he played, but his, his, his working in those gears. That's one of the things that makes Federer very, very pleasing to watch because I think of our three, he's the one whose multiple gears are most uh, engaging that way because he got so many shots and so many things he does. I think Roger knew that the best play was to make a high percentage of first serves to the Nori backhand. We've talked about the righty lefty dynamic and how when you have opposite handedness serving to each other's backhand, it's very difficult. Um, for the returner to get it to the server's backhand. We've spoken about that when it comes to Nadal, but it's kind of the same dynamic the other way. And Federer made 67% of his first serves and only hit seven aces. I just don't think he was going for the aces. That wasn't the plan. The plan was get it to Nori's backhand on the first serve to set up the first forehand. I totally agree with you, Amy, that, that Federer had that, that plan on his serve. He knew what gear he wanted it to be in, and he executed that game plan. Yeah, and let's make no bones about it. If he is going to win at Wimbledon, then he's going to have to uh, have the serve clicking on all cylinders. I mean, he needs free points. That's just who he is. And it doesn't necessarily have to be aces, but it could be return errors. It could be the, the serve plus one put away. Um, the, these games have to be easy for him because when he starts getting into complicated service games, that's where the wheels come off. And that's not new. He's always yeah. been that way. Well, and go back 09, Roddick with the final versus Roddick, he said 50 aces. Uh, and that was 16, 14, the fifth. So it was a long final, but still, I think you're absolutely right. I think particularly as he's aged, uh, quicker mm -hmm. points, free of points, short forehands, all the things that come with that, with good serving. So again, and that gets the thing we noticed before a few weeks ago about is the leg strength there to get him, have a hit the serve as big as he wants. And uh, 
we'll see. This was a good, this is a, a, a reasonably good test. I think you're right, Gil. He didn't, didn't need to think about acing Nori. He needs to think about placing him. And, and aces, you know, aces, you kind of write off. Aces are just aces. What really matters is, is sequences, is the serve plus one. Yeah. Gil, you had a good stat that you texted us that came from the ESPN broadcast from Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. What was that? It was it was that Federer's serve speed, his average serve speed, is exactly what it was in 2019 on the first serve, and it's pretty much the same as well on the second serve. So there is no reduction in serve speed for Federer from the time he made the final, which is what you want to hear if you're a Federer fan. So. Yes, that, that is great news. I mean, after the two knee surgeries and people yep. are thinking that they're looking at him going, I ah, just can't keep up. Something's come off, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, if something has come off, then it's not the serve speed. You can put that one away. Stop worrying about that. Um, and, and, you know, all I see right now is the Federer pretty much that we've we've always known at Wimbledon just playing himself into form. Yeah. All right, so to get to, to Novak's third round match, I think th there's just one little part of the Federer match that I think was uh, actually a common denominator in Novak's as well, which is uh, just how well Federer and Djokovic handle the, the moment of, of playing on center court at Wimbledon, which is the pinnacle for a lot of players, a really big deal. Uh, for for Nori, I think it was his first time on center. I could be mistaken. He is British, so he's going to get the benefit of that scheduling. And uh, for Dennis Kudla, um, I believe it it may have been his as well, or if not, he but he's not on there very often. Run. That match is on oh court. right, right. Kudla on court, run. right, right. So so a big court though, a, a stadium at Wimbledon. Nori seemed to be fighting his nerves early on, and then Kudla in the third set he got his first chance his first chance in front of Novak and did not respond well. And it's just, uh, to me, I think both Federer and Djokovic benefited from their opponents, just feeling their nerves a lot and reflecting in their game in the big moments. But of course it comes with the contrast that Federer and Djokovic are so good at not letting their nerves get to them. Agreed. But, uh, I also think, uh, center court, Nori British guy and playing the crowd, that lends itself to nerves, but also lends itself to energy. Mm -hmm. And there's a very different energy. I spend a lot of time on both those courts. Court one, court one is, well, it's certainly a big court. It's always interesting how the, the second big court at a major is something different than the third big court at the major. It's almost like the second one is, is, is so close enough to the one that it's kind of like, there's not quite as good replicant as opposed to the boutique court of let's say court two or another court. So I think, I think the energy, I watched Federer lose to Kevin Anderson on court one. The court one energy is kind of its own kind of thing, an awareness of a big court, but it's not, it's, it's not quite center court. So I, I think for Kudla, it was also just the occasion of who he was playing and the chance to possibly go into a fourth set with him. And I think Novak, again, so, uh, so impregnable. And again, th those guys, of course, experience, experience matters. I mean, they're familiar with all of that stuff. Bounces, right. sunlight, occasions. And everything to someone like a Kudler or Nor is like, whoa, this is new. Oh my God, it's 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 five o'clock, and here I am on this big show court testing this guy. Oh, look at that person in the stands. Yeah. So what happened was Kudla went up four two. Novak double faulted twice in the third set tiebreak, and from from four two up, Dennis just played some really poor points. But then on match point, he played a fantastic point, and Novak still won it. And maybe we'll get back to that. But I wanna I wanna go to you, Amy. What do you think of uh, Novak's match? I was actually less focused on the tennis it, itself um, than I was on what was happening with the crowd. I mean, how many matches is it going to take for people to understand that heckling Djokovic is not a good idea? I mean, it's just it doesn't work. So stop doing it. It's it's um, it fired him up. He brought out his inner wolf. And uh, he, he made a story for himself. Joel and I have a friend, Bob Litwin, who is a senior tennis champion. He's a world champion. And he talks about how you write your own story. And, and if you're not doing well, then you need to rewrite your story. And uh, I think 
Djokovic came up with this narrative for himself that that really pushed him to the finish line, but he really didn't need a big push. Um, the other the other thing that I, I would say my impressions of that match are how many opponents are going to play Djokovic and think that they can beat the guy from the baseline playing their baseline game, dude, it's not going to work. You've got, and Joel and I have talked about this. You got to come up with something else. I'm, okay. I'm kind of on the other side though. I feel like I might, I might push back on, on that one a little bit. Not the first point. Which point? The, the point that, that going to net is going to be some kind of answer. Uh, I, if, you, if you're not ahead. used to it, if you don't know how to volley, then you're right. If, if, right. if you're not comfortable up there and oh, I can't execute a volley, or if you do execute a volley, you think to yourself, my God, I've got to keep doing that over and over again. And, and it scares you, then you're right. You might as well okay. just play your baseline game and hand it to him. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Joel, th thoughts on, on Novak versus the crowd, because he, Basically, I think what happened was um, Kudla got a net cord and it trickled over for a winner. And some guys who were rooting against Novak cheered really loudly. And that, that got Novak's attention. He was like, seriously, guys? Uh, and then from that point on, Djokovic was kind of using it as fuel. We, we've, we've, seen, we've seen this before where Novak becomes, I would, I would say the word is defiant against a, uh, a hostile crowd. Novak is used to playing in front of crowds that kind of get on him sometimes and he finds his energy and he finds his fuel and that kind of propelled him to win that. There were some chances though for um, Kudla could have done versus Novak what, uh, what Nori did versus Federer and take it into a fourth set. And that would have been intriguing to see, but it didn't happen. But to, to get back to our point about, about tactics versus Novak, my motto is find another way to lose. So it's not a question of, a, of the volley person becoming Patrick Rafter and chipping and charging and serving and volleying and being at the net a hundred times. It's just a way, what coming to net does, it applies pressure that even if you lose the point, you let the opponent know you're there. So if you serve and volley a few times, now you bring the net into returning. Now you at least do some things to let Novak know, and as great as he is, hey, it's not gonna just be easy for you this way. I'm gonna do some things. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, remember the time Dustin Brown beat Nadal? At Wimbledon, I mean, again, I'm not saying, and I, I'm not now for a Dustin Brown. That's a one-off, and he lost suit enough, and he played this executed this great match. But I, I'm going to go back to the, the development cycle. So for parents, players, instructors, building player tools, this is what it's about. So as much as I think um, any instructor wants to fetishize our three, particularly Novak, given how well he's playing right now, keep in mind. Build a player who can beat Novak. Build the game of tomorrow, not just the replicant of today that's going to be dated by tomorrow. So that's what's interesting. And so I think that's, that's a big part about uh, what, you take, what we can take away from our three, building the game that can beat them. Yeah. Well, um, Kudla, Kudla did go after it a little bit. Um, you know, he, he definitely wasn't passive. He took his rips. He was aggressive. He, he tried to take matters into his own hands. Uh, but uh, one of the thing that, that becomes challenging, especially when you don't go to net is just finishing these points against someone who moves and defends as well as Novak. And I just think the match point was a, a perfect illustration of what Novak can do on the surface in terms of movement and defense, which uh, I feel like is just previously unthought of it's an impossibility this is a surface that quote unquote you can't defend on and novak defends on it uh in a way that is just reminiscent more like of of hard courts and and clay courts right and i know that that statement is an absolute you can't but you know if if you soften it a little bit it becomes it's just really difficult to do but novak seems to be so comfortable doing it I don't think of it as, I think it's, I think what Novak is doing is transcending these terms of offense and defense. He's extending of the way that um, you go back through uh, non people like Agassi, people like Connors, Jim Courier got to the finals at Wimbledon uh, for all sorts of reasons. But 
I think there's just a different way that Novak it's, it's, I know what you mean about defense and, and hunkering down, but there's some other way that Novak is applying pressure and he's showing more and more the completeness of his kind of game. And for a long time, the two handed backhand was considered, Oh, that's the, that's the handicapped backhand. That's the lesser, that makes you less of a complete player because you have a two handed backhand, but Novak, Hey, wait a second. Hey, wait a second, guys. No, no, I'm more complete. Look at, look how uh, the down the line backhand is one of the biggest game changers in tennis. And, and that's because the two handed backhand, what players can do the, the one handed backhand is, is not nearly as technically able to hit deep drives. And what Novak can do with his down the line backhand and open up the court, all of that, just tremendous. I'm more talking about a shot that should be a point ending shot. And then it's not against Novak. Right. That too. That How too. demoralizing is that? And I did make a note that that match point was Novak's game in a microcosm. And there were, I think, at least twice, two times during that point that Kudla either should have won the point right there or should have taken command of that point. And there were two different Gumby moves where he was outstretched and extended the point. And often I think he does it with depth. He has this innate sense of how to return the ball with depth or in a rally, get the ball when he's in a, a defensive position, get the ball back with depth. And we all know what depth does, it kills. Exactly right, depth solves all. It's so uh, underrated and it's because it's it's just not, quite as sexy as a winner down the line, but it's just as effective to hit it deep up the middle. <laughs> um, That's right. All right do, do we want a, a word on Andy Murray, Amy, before we go on to the round of 16 matches? I understand uh, we've had a, we've, we have a request. One of our YouTube, wonderful YouTube commenters said, could you say something about Andy Murray? And after Murray lost the other day um, to Shapovalov, he said some things like, I'm just not sure if it's worth it. I mean, poor guy. When when just the match earlier or two matches earlier, he had said, stop asking me if this is my last Wimbledon. <laughs> um, so it, it reminded me actually of when Novak lost to Cechinato in 2018 um, in the, I believe it was the round of 16. And, and then right after the match, they go up to him and they go, Novak, you know, man, what, what's going on? What do you think? And he said, they, they said something about Wimbledon. And he said, I don't even know if I'll play grass this year. And then he went on to win Wimbledon. <laughs> it's a good thing he played grass that year. But you just say things, you know, you just say things in the, in the mm -hmm. heat of a loss. And the, the thing that I really liked about Murray's comments um, earlier in the tournament was he said, quote, I just want to play. And it reminds me of a little boy. He just wants to play. And, and so I would tell fans of Murray, um, don't, don't be too upset or, or, you know, bothered by him saying that, you know, he, he just doesn't know if it's worth it just that soon after a loss. That's a great point. And he'll, uh, He'll play. I think that I, I, don't worry that don't worry about Murray not playing more worry more about Murray's movement and his forehands because he be, he was looking pretty uh, well worn in the course of that match in the course of his loss. It doesn't mean he's necessarily retiring because you're right. He wants to play. And, and I wrote about this, about how a night a night in the British summer was like the ones he probably had with his brother when he was a teenager, wanting to squeeze out a few more minutes of daylight and play some more tennis and continue. And I think, you know, we're seeing so much, uh, such a, such a theme in sports, just give me another chance. Just give me some more chances. And, and as the careers get longer, that's going to become even more of a need because we're our, our sense of age of what used to be 30 was the witching hour. So 32 and Murray's 34 and here's Roger 40. So what's that all going to mean? We're going to have like these, uh, you know, eight year long farewell tours. <laughs> yeah. Oh, please go. Well, I think it might benefit him to get a little bit desperate because I think there's adjustments that he needs to make in his game. And he hasn't been quite as malleable as Nadal and Djokovic um, have been, and maybe even Federer. I think he's really stayed the same. And uh, I, I do hope that, that maybe, maybe he'll change that because he hates the feeling, you know, I mean, he was so, he was so upset after uh, losing to Dennis. 
Um, all right, uh, let's start with Djokovic, who gets uh, Christian Garin next. It's a 1-0 head-to-head. They played at the ATP Cup. Djokovic won 3-3. Three and three. Uh, You know, Garin does not have a very impressive resume off clay. Um, and uh, I just, I kind of feel the same way about this matchup that I did before the tournament, uh, which is that it's not really someone who who's going to be able to push Novak in all likelihood. I agree. I mean, this is kind of, this is a pretty, uh, it's around 16, so you can't quite say this, but it has sort of a certain batting practice quality to it. Like truly, I mean, this Garin is tremendous reach the 16s of Wimbledon. It's not, this is not the time where, well, now I'm going to pull some new rabbits out of my hat. You know, it's like, that's, this is the dilemma of skills and pro tennis. It's kind of like, okay, I'm going to go in there with what I have and I'm going to hope for the best and see if I can catch some things and disrupt him and do some things. But really, I just, I just think Novak again, he's so, so focused and so sharp and so sound that uh, I don't see, I don't see him being tested significantly at all. There are those who are saying that Djokovic's draw in this tournament has been a cakewalk. Um, this, the, the, those might point to this match as an example. Um, personally, I think if you're the number one player in the world and defending champion, then you deserve that draw. Um, well, can I, can I interrupt there? Please, Medvedev please. on the other side for example, right? So just the argument against that is Medvedev is the two seed, which is actually the same as the one seed technically in the draw math. And right now he's about to go five with Marin Cilic in the third round on his best surface. In the first round, he had Jan Lennard Struff, who we've talked about how dangerous he is. And the second round, pretty easy against Carlos Alcaraz. But so, so Novak, uh, Garin is an overseeded player because of what he does on clay. So it's fortunate to get him at, at Wimbledon. Oh, I wouldn't. Call, I don't call him an overseeded. I don't think he's an overseeded player. I think he's a seeded player. I mean, an overseed is just a. It, it's not. It's just. It, it's the point of seeding in the ATP world is hey, this is this is the result of what I've done for 52 weeks. Thank you very much. I'm not. It, I, it's each tournament we've had. The tournament is not a silo unto itself. Therefore, it's grass. So, yeah. um, you know, you want to. I mean, so. That's not the point yet. Medvedev, the number two seed, who Novak crushed in the Australian Open final. I mean, it's 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 just fascinating. But he, the draw is the draw appears easy when you're that much better. That's kind of the problem. And also, yeah. there's there's so much. Um, I mean, there's so much insufficient data all around still in tennis this year. I mean, we've had we've had the clay court season. But we didn't have as much of a hard court season, and and it's just it's just so un- fuzzy what all these things are. And I think that makes it that much easier for the people, the experience and the match results and the, the consistent, you know, the confidence, the awareness, particularly at a place as you know, Wimbledon is so funny on the one hand, it's institutional and it's significant, but it's also kind of wacky. Wow. Grass, you know, grass, that's kind of a whole adjustment curve. And so for a guy like Garin, Whoa, second week of grass. I mean, how many mat, how many practice sets has he ever played on grass how, and much less how many matches? Yeah, I I don't see this one as a problem. I feel like a broken record. I say that every time. Right. Um, maybe we should just talk about Federer's next well, opponent. Well, uh, here's <laughs> the contest on Garin. Go ahead. So Garin is 0-4 against top 50 players on grass. He's 2-8 and against top 10 players on any surfaces. The two wins are on clay. He... You know, his ranking is very much buoyed because he's fantastic um, on, you know, clay 250s, some clay 500s. And to his credit, he had his deepest run at a major at Roland Garros this year, reaching the fourth round, losing in straight sets to Daniil Medvedev, which, in my opinion, wasn't a great showing for him. Uh, but but that's that's who he's been on the tour. Gil, with that research, I would like to put you on the Wimbledon seating committee as I want everybody seated based on their surface prowess and um, that you guys know where I stand on that. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> I, I, I will say this. <laughs> is, that, is, that a way of, is, that a, is that my way of saying I don't... Uh, I, I think I, I'd be interested to know in the future of Wimbledon they want to resume that when there are more things, but I'm not quite sure 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure if they want to resume Look, grass seeding. I have no problem with, with as, as long as there are draws, some players are, are going to, and they're picking out of a hat. Some years it's going to be really tough. Some years it's going to be really easy. There's actually a lot of data that suggests that Novak's, uh, the majority of, of Novak slam titles have been more difficult um, th- than the other two. The data just based on, on literal, literal rankings math. Um, and with that being said, Federer has been enormously fortunate in my opinion with his draw, because I also think that if Federer had, I don't know, Daniil Medvedev's draw, I don't know that he'd still be around given how he looked against Adrian Manorino and having to work himself into the tournament. Still I not think- a believer. <laughs> in Federer? Yeah. He just needs some time. Yeah, so you think, do you think he would have beaten Struff in the first round playing? Like, I know it's a completely Boy, different matchup. Tough, wouldn't it? And that's Somehow what I'm saying. Better didn't get Struff. Struff, you want Struff? Struff, you're, you're, you're 40 second seeds. You're for your <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just, I, the, apropos of nothing, and I, I don't want to get into too much of this, but yeah. I've been reading through a lot of the PTPA stuff and um, just like going through all the, what it is that they're trying to do in terms of equity and things like that. And it it has dawned on me, I knew this already, but it's really dawned on me just how important the slams are for the financial picture of these individual players. I mean, it's their livelihood. That's where all the prize money is in, in proportion to the other things that they do on tour. And um, I I just, I, I, it needs to be fair because it means so much to these players, it's got to be fair. So let me ask you while we're, since we hit on PTPA, is your sense that the PTP, they wanna create more money for those 120, okay, if you look at the slam draws, Wimbledon, that first round prize money and amenities are greater for the 128 in, in Wimbledon, or, is, or what are the implications of this for players ranked, let's say 150 to 250? They, the PTPA is, has not really talked about the slams as much yet. Right now, they're working on their relationship with the ATP and the the 1000s and the 250s and the 500s. They're trying to hash out. And I think that's a good place to start. And you know what? The ATP, despite first saying that they weren't going to recognize them, now they're listening to them and they're engaging in a dialogue. So good for Novak for for sticking to it. And and now there's a dialogue. And the ATP for stopping with the talk to the hand act. Yes. But also, so again, so if we're talking about, yeah, the slams, which are not quite not, not ATP as such, even though they, even though the PTPA would like a bigger percentage of the slam purse, but also the 250s and the 1000s, which are meant for players still in top 100, because there are even fewer, smaller draws in those events than that. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to understand, I'm trying to eventually, and and this isn't for this talk, but I want to eventually understand the PTPA vision of what income income equality means more for how many tennis players, for 128, for 256, et cetera. But we'll, we'll, and so again, it'll be interesting to see more how Novak and Pospisil, who are kind of the, you know, the, the co-leaders of this effort, how that goes and uh, how that works. It's, 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 it's becoming somewhat more clear after being quite abstract for a while. We're excited to get, to get into that after, after Wimbledon. I'm sure we'll, <laughs> we'll have some good conversations. Uh, before we move on from, from Garin to Lorenzo Senego, who Federer faces in the fourth round, I do think some people listening might want some sort of idea about Garin's game. I think his greatest strength is his speed. He does have a pretty big forehand. He's got a flat backhand, but it's not, it's not um, sometimes struggles when you get it low to his backhand. He's not very good there. Uh, has issues notoriously with nerves sometimes as well. Um, and, you know, I, he, he is someone who can run a lot and is very, very fit. It's kind of my assessment. Anything to add? He'll have a chance to demonstrate both those skills on Monday. He'll be running. He'll be doing a lot of running. Yeah, he'll be running. He'll be running and he'll, he'll, he'll gain a lot of fitness. And he'll have some experience. And there'll be, I think, and again, this will carry into Senego as well. I don't think he'll have, he'll have a few noble moments where he extracts some errors from Novak and wins some rallies. And there will be two all in the first set. I mean, I just think he's going to see, I, I just think 
Novak is so, again, so impregnable. I mean, I think the question goes, hmm, how, what's my plan for winning points against him? What am I going to do here? And this gets to the point Amy made a little while ago. Really? I'm going to out baseline him? And even on grass? I mean, I just, so it, it'd be fascinating to talk with uh, Garin and his coach and say, what are you guys hatching for this one? Or do you not, or, or is the thing like, hey, look, we're in the 16s. Let's just dig in, try to get a lot of first serves, not make mistakes and hope for the best. Have fun. Have fun out there. Enjoy it. Take it in. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. That, that might be it. Uh, and uh, as the one, the one person who's willing to, uh, to make uh, predictions on the show, I'm going to predict uh, one set will be a breadstick or worse for Christian Garin, better for Novak Djokovic. Um, Lorenzo Sinego has played Roger Federer once, Federer won. That was on clay, 2019 Roland Garros. It was a straight set, three set victory for Federer. Sinego beat James Duckworth in the last round, Galan. Pedro Souza, um, he is the number 26 seed, made the final at Eastbourne, though, and um, pushed Alex Di Minore in the final, so he came very close to coming into Wimbledon with a grass court title under his belt. Uh, a very fiery con- competitor who really uh, embraces the moment and I think will will relish the chance to, to face Roger Federer. This one's going to be a little more slash and burn. This is going to be some moments. There'll be some... There'll be some- remarkable shots he's going to hit. So that's going to be some interesting little things to see how he tries to strike at Federer and what he kind of does and, and how he tries to match his tools. I think, I think he's a, there's a dynamic quality to him that's kind of exciting and a certain passion he brings. So then of course, then, then there's also the, the nerve factor, but still how he, uh, how he grapples that. I, I'm, I'm way more intrigued to watch this match than the Djokovic match. To me, what'll be interesting to see is how he will rise to the occasion of center court, assuming that the match is going to be on center court. I mean, it's one thing to slash and and burn in the run up to Roland Garros or the tune up to Wimbledon, but it's another thing to do the raise the roof thing in front of the Royal box. So with Federer's experience and his calm and all that, um, I just don't know how the juxtaposition is going to work in these two um, personality styles. Well, I think it's going to be a lot with his racket too. I think he's going to look to um, do the stuff with his racket and, hit and slash some shots. I don't. I don't think he's going to quite uh, raise his arms and fists on on hollow center court. But I, again, he, he does. That's what he does in Italy. I'll tell you when 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 does. you put Senego in Rome, he's uh, he's vocal out there. Right. So I think there's going to be a lot more uh, dynamic energy to this match than the Djokovic match. The Djokovic match is going to have a clinical quality. Whereas this one's going to be much more, um, this one's going to be much more, uh, you know, electric in at times. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Federer has a much has many more shots than Sinego. Although Sinego likes to to go for a lot on his ground strokes sometimes, and and you know hit hit some massive forehands from difficult positions. There's uh there's much more to Federer's game in the way of a slice and the ability to serve volley. Where I, I do, you know, Sinego, it's very much forehand sword, backhand shield. Uh, you know, he he has a big serve, but it's big serve first forehand, backhand cross court, topspin, two hander. Um, so I, I just, what I love to see in these kinds of matchups with Federer on grass is how Roger just uses, puts them in, in parts of the court where they're uncomfortable. And, you know, I just don't, I don't see Sinego as someone who, uh, is Mr. Hands or, or anything like that. So I'm fascinated to see how Roger tries to take advantage of that. What I'd like to see from Federer this match, now that we've seen the first week, kind of the, the lower division parts the first week and the, the memory struggle, the Gasquet familiarity, a little bit with Nori. Okay, Roger, I'd like to see something nicely, nicely comprehensive. In other words, that becomes this beca- something tidy and it's kind of brisk and there aren't any hurdles, but it's against someone different than let's say Gasquet. And that, that, would be, that would be yet another progress forward on the Federer train. And also for him too, for his own energy conservation sake too. So he can kind of tidily make his way through this match. And we'll see again. I think, I think I'm still curious to see the whole Federer physicality thing mm-hmm. through the tennis, how that plays out. And again, the grass 
grass covers things, but it reveals things. And there's the agility part and, you know, the footwork. He seems to be managing his body extremely well on grass. I mean, he has slipped a number of times and, and in the match today, he slipped and actually touched his knee down. I got really nervous. Um, but then he popped right back up. So he's actually managing this kind of thing. It seems better than the other players around him. Yeah. For, for once. <laughs> hey, better. <laughs> yeah, no, for this, that's, that's kind of his genius is the whole, I mean, the longevity guys are so good at the footwork and the balance and the body maintenance. I mean, Fetter, Connors, Rosewall, I mean, these guys just were so, had such awareness of their technique and all of that. I mean, I can, I can only imagine the, the, the smooth, simple practice sessions Fetter is having now. You know, nice little 24 minutes yep. at a rangy, keep driving around the block a little bit, not too stressful, take a few serves and overheads. Okay, we got it. I mean, you know, he's not, he's no cramming at this point. Yes. Well, I, I also think it's a, it's a one level up in terms of uh, how big a server Sinego is. He really will pop it. Uh, you know, N Nori's decent. Nori has a serve, uh, but Sinego is again, one up. So I also think that's, that's prob one of the biggest areas where it's going to be, all right, now, now I'm in the round of 16. This guy has something for me. And I think the serve is, is where that is um, the number one spot where, where that will show. I want to put in a point about, uh, you mentioned that, Gil, this is going to be the last year of the, of the Manic Monday, the, the greatest day in tennis. Uh, no tennis on the middle Sunday this year for the final time. And Wimbledon becomes that, that combination of that complete day off where the club is mostly vacant and there's no competition. And then something Monday, it really becomes like a whole other tournament. It becomes a little bit like the, the Wizard of Oz when they go from Kansas in black and white to Oz in color. And Wimbledon is kind of neat the first week, but the second week, and I think for people like Federer, of course, it's, it's all familiar and he loves it and he knows it. And so for some of these other players, it's like, whoa, here I am. What is that? And again, the key for Novak... He's got, Novak is going to do it. He's going to slowly strangle whoever he plays. That's going to play. Federer might want to see if he can just kind of jump right over Senego. Say, hey, second week I'm here. You know, get out, try to get it. If he can do enough things to get off to one of those quick leads and be in charge right away and kind of run him off the court. I mean, I'll be interested to see if Federer can do that. Or if he has to again to enter into kind of slowly strangle, problem solve, work his way through mode. Yeah. Can, can Federer avoid the trenches? Exactly. All right. Well, we'll see. We're, we're all pretty confident that Novak will be able to do that. Um, but um, we're looking forward to, to continuing day off on Sunday. Uh, it's, our, it's the last one ever. Um, so, God, we, we better make it count. That's a lot of pressure tomorrow for us. I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about what we have planned for our days. Uh, that'll do it for this episode of 3. Remember, we're available on all podcast platforms. Subscribe, follow, leave a rating and a review on Apple. And if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, leave a comment and subscribe. We'll see you next time on the next episode of 3.